Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Hard to believe that it happened 33 years ago, but there it is, or there it was. Launch Complex 374-7 near Damascus, Arkansas, went up in an enormous fireball, sending its nuclear warhead about 200 yards distant, taking one life immediately and altering scores of others and maybe in a way changing the way America thought about nuclear weapons. And if it didn't, our guest just may with his new work, Eric Schlosser's Command and Control. Eric Schlosser joins us now in the library of the Clinton School of Public Service. Yeah. Thanks very much for this time. What brought you Thanks to the book, me. Eric Schlosser? I wrote a book called Fast Food Nation that was set in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And one of the place I, places I visited was the NORAD Command Center inside of Cheyenne Mountain, which was buried inside of this mountain so that it might withstand a Soviet attack. And it was fascinating, and I got to know guys in the Air Force. And in Colorado Springs, there's also the Air Force Space Command, which is eventually going to be responsible for warfare in outer space. So I spent time with these guys, and they started telling me a lot of Cold War stories because most of the people in the Space Command at that point had started off as launch officers. And one of them told me the story of this accident in Damascus, Arkansas, involving a Titan II missile. I'd never heard it. I'd never remembered it having happened. I thought it was an incredible, incredible story. <coughs> and just almost coincidentally, as I was visiting different Air Force bases uh, in the United States for something I was thinking about writing, I got the opportunity to watch the launch of a Titan II missile from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And I think the Air Force liked me, but they let me stand really close to the missile when it launched. And after the, you indemnified the Air yeah, Force. I after I indemnified the Air Force. And the officer who was my host had never stood that close. And it was an awesome, awesome sight. And the combination of hearing this extraordinary story about the Titan II and seeing one launch and realizing as a child of the Cold War that these things work and they had awesome power. This wasn't even the detonation of a nuclear weapon. This was just the launch of one of these missiles. Those missiles were huge and they really could fly. And there were 18 of them. I believe 18 in Arkansas until That's right. the last was decommissioned. Yeah. And, I mean, Arkansas, I've spent, you know, I've made a number of visits here over the years while researching the book, and I've really loved being here, and particularly in the foothills of the Ozarks, you know, where in and around Damascus, beautiful. But I, but I have to say, it was sort of an odd place to put 18 intercontinental ballistic missiles with the most powerful warhead ever on an American missile. And so it, 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 it was a sort of unusual setting, not only for the book, but for the Air Force to have put the missiles here. Well, stranger even than, say, well, the others were located. They in North Dakota, I believe, and other parts of the, the Wyoming, I think. They tended to put these missiles in very remote rural areas, particularly in the American West, so that if there was a problem with a missile, they wouldn't necessarily be endangering the local population. Right. Uh, but in Arkansas, these missiles were in rural areas, but they were in populated rural areas. And compared to other missiles, like the Minuteman missile, which has a solid fuel, the Titan II was a particularly dangerous missile to have as your neighbor, even if there wasn't a warhead on top of it. What made it so dangerous, Eric, was that the, the, it was the fuel combination, the propellants, yeah. actually. Yeah, uh, it was the. Or am I correct? You are correct. It was it were the propellants, the liquid propellants, and you know NASA has used liquid propellants from the very beginning of the space age and still uses liquid propellants. But when they're launching a rocket to the moon or they're going to launch a satellite, they don't load up the rockets with the propellants until they're getting close to launch, because these are very toxic, very corrosive, dangerous dangerous chemicals, some of the most dangerous chemicals that there are. But in the case of the Titan II, the Titan II, because it needed to be launched on a moment's notice, would sit in its silo in rural Arkansas with these propellants for weeks, months, years at a time. And because these propellants, particularly the oxidizer, there was a 
One was a, an oxidizer that had oxygen in it. The other was a rocket fuel. And they were in separate tanks. And when they came down the missile and met in the rocket engine, engine they'd touch and ignite. And that's what would make the rocket fly up into the sky. But this, this oxidizer is incredibly corrosive. So there were constantly leaks of propellant. And uh, you know, aside from the fact that the missile could explode, if the oxidizer leaked into your neighborhood, it could kill you or severely injure you. And there were oxidizer leaks here that killed cattle, that sickened people. And uh, the story that I've been told and the story that was published is that Congressman Wilbur Mills, who was head of the House Ways and Means Committee and a very powerful Democrat, wanted to bring some federal investment to Arkansas. So he cut a deal. And as part of the deal, Arkansas got those 18 Titan II missiles and some investment in the state. But uh, as part of the bargain, they got a very dangerous weapon system in their midst. And in fact, the, uh, the explosion at Damascus was the second involving, in re within what, five, four, four or five years, involving that silo. There had, been a, there had been a serious oxidizer leak at that very silo that had uh, killed cattle, sickened people in nearby Damascus. And you know, houses were not that far away from that, uh, from that missile complex. There was an elementary school that wasn't that far away from that missile complex. And you know, in the, in the heat of the Cold War, I think risks were taken which you'd never take today because it really seemed like you know, these were dangerous times and people had to assume a certain amount of risk. But looking back, I don't think it was a very good idea to put Titan II missiles in Arkansas. And I think the state is very fortunate that there wasn't an even more catastrophic accident. One of the predicates of your book, one of the components of your book, is that if, if the experts realized the risk involved, they didn't always share the knowledge of that risk with the countryside, with, with the citizenry. No, they didn't. And Robert McNamara, when he was Secretary of Defense in the Kennedy, uh, he was in the Kennedy and the Johnson administrations, he was ready to retire the Titan IIs in the late 1960s. They were supposed to start going out of service around 67, 68. Uh, the Minuteman missile, which is the, which in the Cold War was the real heart of our missile deterrent, had a solid fuel. And that solid fuel was much less dangerous to be around. So, you know, by 1980, we had a thousand or so Minuteman missiles and only 54 Titan IIs. The, fi the Titan IIs numerically were a trivial part of our um, arsenal. What was significant about them was the warhead on top of the Titan II, as I said earlier, was the most powerful nuclear warhead the United States ever put onto a missile. It was a nine megaton warhead. And that one warhead in Damascus, Arkansas, which was the same warhead in all the silos in Arkansas, um, had the three times the explosive force of all the bombs used by all the armies in the Second World War. All the armaments, everything that all fell the armaments, in World War II. Three times, including both atomic bombs. I mean, that's an extraordinarily powerful weapon. And so <clears throat> the United States was reluctant to just get rid of the Titan II without getting the Soviets to get rid of something as a concession. Because these, we these missiles, even though they were only 54, represented a huge proportion of the megatonnage of the explosive force of our arsenal. Henry Kissinger you know, was quite blunt in his memoirs and in some of the documents that have been revealed. He was desperate to get rid of the Titan II. He felt like it was an obsolete and unreliable, inaccurate weapon system. But if you go back again to, to the arms race that we had with the Soviet Union, it would have taken a big step of courage to voluntarily get rid of our missiles um, when the Soviets weren't going to give anything in return. And he tried to trade some very big, po powerful Soviet missiles, and we'd get rid of our Titan IIs. And the Soviets had no interest, because they knew that the Titan II was increasingly obsolete. So it wasn't just a, st in, in the military, so it wasn't just a strategic nor tactical a, a question, but a political question as well. In it the, was in a the climate of the 80s and the it was 70s. A, it, it was a. It would be a bargaining chip 
in arms control talks. Now, having said that, if we were to go to war with the Soviet Union, that was a fearsome, fearsome weapon to be used against them. But it could only really be used in a first strike. And our war plan did not call for a surprise attack on the Soviet Union. But uh, the war plan, the nuclear war plan that we had in the 70s, really emphasized that if it looked like we were going to go to war with the Soviets, we were going to try to hit them before they hit us. Uh, so the Titan II was only good for that purpose because when the silos were being built in around 1961-62, you know, they weren't aware of how powerful and how accurate the Soviet missiles were going to become. So it was a fearsome weapon, but I have to say it also put a very big bullseye on the state of Arkansas yeah, because the Titan II <coughs> wasn't that accurate, so it really only had a couple of uses. It could be aimed at uh, command bunkers in big cities like Moscow. It could be aimed at major ports or major military installations. So it was something that the Soviets would want to get rid of fairly quickly. So it was, uh, it was an extraordinary thing to have in a small state like this. Well, fit, let's figure uh, uh, Damascus into the larger context of your book, which uh, the subtitle is, I think, The Illusion of, of Command and Control yeah. <clears throat> of, of Security of America's Nuclear, or for that matter, the world's nuclear arsenals, plural. Uh, a lot of people wonder how, when Damascus, the, the origin of the explosion at Damascus was neither the origin nor the outcome was nuclear. Yeah. I mean, we had a socket wrench that fell, you know, yeah. a young airman accidentally dropped a sock, punctured the skin of the, uh, of the missile. Yeah. Propellant came out or oxidizer came out and a few hours later, yeah. Well, the warhead did not detonate. The warhead did not detonate and the Air Force at the time was adamant that there was no possibility of that warhead detonating. One of the reasons that this book took me six years uh, and is significantly longer than the book that I set out to write is the Air Force wasn't telling the truth. And there are a couple of narratives in the book, a couple of main narratives. One of the narratives is a minute-by-minute minute description of the unfolding of the Damascus accident. May I say it's a gripping read. You're, thank you're, you. Thank you for that. Thank you. And the other narrative is about the growing realization in the weapons community among designers, weapons designers in the United States, that our nuclear weapons are vulnerable, were vulnerable in that period to accidental detonation. And in the book I write about something the Air Force didn't tell the people of Arkansas at the time, but there was a major study done of our nuclear weapons at the Sandia National Laboratory, which is one of our major weapons labs. And they listed the <coughs> weapons in you know, greatest order of risk of accidental detonation. And the W-53 warhead on top of the Titan II was uh, considered the least safe warhead. You would never put a warhead with the safety devices it had at the time on a missile today. And so there's a, there, there's a major narrative of the book about the weapons designers at Sandia, one of them who I think was truly heroic, named Robert Purifoy, who later wound up being vice president of the lab, and his effort to get modern safety devices installed. So that warhead on that missile did not detonate, but it could have. I think the best way to put it would be it was improbable that it would detonate, but not impossible. But it was also improbable that that, whip it, that, that missile could explode because someone dropped a socket. Uh, I spent time with the PTS crews. Those were the guys who serviced the missiles. You could drop a socket from that work platform within the silo, like the young worker did, a thousand times trying to hit the missile and never hit the missile. It was a completely freak bizarre accident and tools fell in the silo all the time and what would happen is they'd be working on a work platform a tool flashlight something would fall they'd have to climb you know take the elevator go all the way down to the bottom of the silo go down into what was called the w below the missile
pick up the tool and go get it. And this was just a, a, a low probability, high consequence event. And that's what the detonation of a nuclear weapon inadvertently would be. The odds are low, but if it happens, the consequences are unimaginable. And if that warhead had detonated that night in Damascus, Arkansas, no, uh, quite honestly, it would have changed the course of American history. It would have engulfed this state in firestorms. It would have sent radioactive fallout up the east coast of the United States. And Bill Clinton, who was in hot springs for the Democratic Convention, and Vice President Walter <coughs> Mondale, who was also there at the time, would have had a life-changing experience. My family farm is uh, just about 30 miles from Damascus, so I presume <clears throat> that, you know, the tomato crop would have been, the backyard garden would have been edible it, for a uh, couple of thousand years. The land around there would not be farmed for a long, long, long time. Dema uh, the, the, the weapon that didn't explode at yeah. Damascus had yeah. its counterparts in wep nuclear weapons that didn't explode in other states following other, well, you saw the example of one, one airman uh, servicing, I think, a, a fighter bomber or a bomber, and a an H bomb fell eight, nine feet from the belly of the plane yeah. onto the runway and, and didn't explode. Yeah. I mean, one of, the themes, one of the themes of the book is how it's basically our ability to, our ability to create complex technologies exceeds our ability to control them. So it's an illusion of control. I think that we build nuclear weapons safer than any other in the world, any, any other country in the world. We invented this technology. We perfected it. We, you know, at one point we had 32,000 nuclear weapons. We've probably built a total of 60 or 70,000 of them, and we've never had one of them accidentally detonate. And that's a tribute to the skills of the weapons designers. A lot of the book is about the heroism of ordinary servicemen who risked their lives and sometimes lost them to prevent nuclear catastrophes. But there's no question we've come close. We've come much too close to an accidental detonation. And there is no guarantee whatsoever that our good fortune will last. Yeah, well, I'm most, much, I think it's fair to say much of the concern public con expressed in public arena, in the public arena anyway, has been not a technical malfunction, uh, the fail-safe sort of, of, yeah. of scenario, as it has been rogue states. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the nature of, you know, maniacs, loose nukes, small nukes, briefcase nukes. Yeah. You said a moment ago something that <clears throat> the U.S. In, in its manufacture of weapon systems had made them as safe or safer than any other yeah. nation. And at the same time, you note in your book that the Soviet Union had a tighter command mechanism over, it, political mechanism, yeah. administrative mechanism over its nuclear weapons than the U.S. did. Some people believe that um, because they had an authoritarian governmental system. So they exercised extreme tight control over who had access to their weapons within their own military. We had a very different nuclear strategy. We uh, had delegated in advance the authority to use nuclear weapons to officers down the chain of command. Under the law, only the president can authorize the use of nuclear weapons. But during the Eisenhower administration, uh, President Eisenhower delegated in advance, pre-delegated the authority to uh, officers in Europe. If uh, the Soviet tanks were rolling over West Germany and American troops were about to be overrun and communications with Washington had been cut off, those troops were allowed to use their nuclear weapons. If it looked like Washington, D.C. and New York City and Omaha, Nebraska, the headquarters of the Strategic Air Command, had all been wiped out. Uh, there were high-level officers who were allowed and given, you know, advance authorization to use their weapons. The Soviets were much more wary of doing that, much more authoritarian, 
and they came up with an even more dangerous system. In the United States, when you pre-authorize officers uh, to be able to use weapons, there's a chance you might get a rogue officer. There's a chance that you know somebody might become unhinged. Uh, but we depended on the esprit de corps and the discipline of our forces, and they behaved that way. In the Soviet Union, um, they created an automated system called the perimeter system, or the dead hand was the nickname for it. And this, is, this sounds like it's out of Dr. Strangelove, but it actually existed. If it was an automated system, and once a Soviet leader switched it on, as soon as it detected nuclear explosions on the soil of the Soviet Union, it would launch Soviet missiles. And that was to protect against what is called a decapitation attack. If the United States launched a preemptive strike or a surprise attack and wiped out the Kremlin, wiped out their top military officials, the Soviet Union wanted to feel confident that they could retaliate. Uh, but created, creating an automated computer-controlled system of retaliation is a very unnerving thing. There's no evidence that it was ever activated. It's clear that it was built. It's also clear the United States had no idea that it existed until after the Cold War. And what's significant about that is we had all kinds of potential nuclear options. Uh, one of them was to fight a limited war. One of them was to hit the Soviets with a few nuclear weapons and try to negotiate or bargain a peace if they're trying to overrun West Germany. And what the existence of the perimeter system revealed to American war planners is there was probably never going to be that nuclear, that limited nuclear war. Because if that system had been switched on, uh, once the, uh, our war had started detonating on Soviet soil, it could have just turned out into an all-out nuclear war. There's a very good book, I think it won a Pulitzer Prize, on the perimeter system called The Dead Hand by a Washington Post reporter. Again, this sounds like the stuff of a Hollywood thriller. Um, it really happened. And one of the themes of the book is just looking at the effort of the United States just to hold on, to keep these weapons under control, to keep that sort of mistake from happening. And it was a, it was a real challenge. And the people who ran our nuclear command and control system had a profoundly stressful job. Uh, they took their work very seriously. They wanted to defend the United States against attack. They didn't want to start a nuclear war by mistake. There were constantly false alarms. There were constantly indications that missiles were coming towards us, and then it turned out that they weren't. Um, so it was a very, very difficult job. And it's amazing that we got through the Cold War, and the Soviet Union vanished from the face of the earth, and the Berlin Wall came down, and Germany was reunited without thousands of people being killed. And it was by no means guaranteed that it would end that peacefully. So we were very fortunate to get out of that conflict without a, a nuclear exchange or without an accidental nuclear detonation. Kind of pyrrhic, though, is it not? Because now we have India that's nuclear, Pakistan that's nuclear. They hate each other or elements of them. Yeah. <clears throat> the prospect of a nuclear arm, it'll, well, Israel already an atomic yeah. nuclear plant. Uh, at the conclusion of <laughs> researching and writing command and control, do you see a way out? I do. And this was a, a very complicated, often very dark subject to spend six years researching. But I'm not apocalyptic. I don't think that we're doomed. And if I thought that, I wouldn't have bothered to write this book. I feel like nuclear weapons have sort of left the national conversation. I think it's very important that we think about them again, that we have a real debate in this country about how many weapons do we need, what's the strategy for using them, uh, which kinds should we have, submarine-based, land-based. These are issues of fundamental importance, and the decisions shouldn't be made by a small group of people in Washington, D.C. They should be part of a national debate. Now, at the end of the book, 
you know, I look at the rate of industrial accidents in other countries as a measure of their ability to manage complex technological systems. And I'm deeply concerned about countries like Pakistan or like India having these systems. We, we hated the Soviet Union, but we hated them from a distance of 6,000 miles. And, you know, we both shared enough of a common set of values so that we, we didn't have a suicidal impulse. Right now, uh, we have countries that are not only celebrating suicide, but are also deliberately targeting civilians in suicide bombings, car bombings, et cetera, et cetera. The notion of those countries or those groups getting um, access to a nuclear weapon is terrifying. So we need to focus on the nuclear threat. And uh, by looking at our own arsenal, and again, I think we've done a better job of anyone at managing it. I think we have the most sophisticated, advanced technological controls, but if we've come close, think about India, Pakistan. Think about if Iran gets a nuclear weapon. And uh, a major city hasn't been destroyed since Nagasaki in 1945, and we don't want to see a major city anywhere in the world taken out by this, uh, this weapon. The book begins and ends in Damascus, Arkansas. It's Command and Control, the author is Eric Schlosser. Thank you very much for this time and for the book. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.